Um meio complicado aqui, né? Mas... challenges and plans for studies, further studies. And we start with a talk by Christopher Cunningham about climate and weather extremes during the South American monsoon season within the context of disaster risk reduction, the experience of Semade. OK. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, well, I would like to to say thanks for the invitation, to for the opportunity to share some of uh, the Semadan experience to you. And it's good to see some familiar faces that I haven't seen for a long time. And I divided my presentation into three parts, three pieces. So first, we will talk a little. I will talk a little bit about uh, concepts there that support semadan activities. Concepts that are related to disaster risk reduction. Then I will follow with this uh, short introduction about semadan, since likely most of the audience doesn't know about semadan. Uh, and so also I will bring an example of how is an operation in, in, in meaning the midst of the monsoon, of the last monsoon here. And finally, I will uh, present some, some examples of development uh, and research. And proposedly, I put develop in first place because we, we are pretty much uh, demanded for research, so applied research. So we have a problem, you have to solve it. So you first, normally you use the, your knowledge to develop some tool that will uh, solve your problem. I mean, kind of in a short time. And the, the more orthodox or research, I mean, it, it's kind of in a, a minor piece there in, in, in Semaden. Well, first, uh, a snapshot about disaster in Brazil. So this is, uh, we have two graphics in here. Uh, one is people affected by weather climate hazards. This is only in Brazil, okay? And the other are people that really uh, fatalities uh, uh, separated by categories uh, according to, to the categories of the, the disasters in Brazil. What, what is interesting about these figures is that they are really, act, they are actual disasters. So they, are re, they were reported, so, okay? So when a disaster occurs, normally it, uh, you have to report the money at the municipality level for the federal government to get some kind of funding, to get facilities to recover you from disaster. So this is a, a, a historical uh, a compendium <laughs> about those, those disasters from 90, sorry, there is in writing here, from 1999 up to 2012, okay? So those are where the disaster registered here in Brazil. And you can see that, sorry, this is in Portuguese, but uh, most, more than 90% of, uh, of, the, of the Brazilian disasters are droughts, flash floods, and floods, which are the, the, the three first in here, okay? Flash floods, what's the difference about flash, uh, between flash <coughs> floods and floods? Floods normally, like in the Amazon River, they are slow, Okay, so very predictable, month ahead. Flash floods, we have two kinds in here. You have one, that it, normally you have watersheds very, very small and it's steep. So the, the, the capturing time for the, for the rainfall is very short. And you quickly, you develop a flood in the river course, okay, in the river route. But you also have uh, nowadays 
what we call enxurradas, which are urban floods, because you pavimented, you, you, you impermeabilize it all in, normally in big cities like Mexico or, or Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, you, uh, you cause this. The, the, the rain flows superficially and causes like it creates a river yeah, uh, in, in, in the midst of the city, okay? You can see that uh, despite the fact that droughts are the, the, this kind of natural disaster that most affect people, it is not the, the, the one that most kill people. The one that most kill people is the, the flash floods here in first place, and in second place, uh, we have the um, landslides, movimento de massa here. Okay, in third place, floods, and droughts in fourth place. So if you consider the, those three, the, the most little flash floods, they account for some, more than 70% of the total of all re recorded disaster in that period, 1999 to 2012. Okay. So this is a graphic that shows, sorry, 1991, yeah, 1991, not 1999. 1991 up to 2012, the, uh, the counts of reported disaster here in Brazil for every year. And you can see clearly that there is this tendency of, uh, of growing in this, in this historical series. And we, we might say, well, likely is, is related to the changes in the weather and climate. It's not totally unrelated, but it's, also, it's not also totally related because there is another factor that is uh, aside the, the, um, the climate and weather factor, which is the urban uh, population growth. So you notice that since the 40s or since the 90s, the urban population is growing. This is a global phenomenon. We, we are aware of that. I think we are all aware of that. And, and this is the main reason why you have this increase in disaster, because people are coming into the cities, and cities are growing, and people are, are kind of occupying spaces that should not be, be occupied by, by people, you know? And, well, this is kind of the, the, the global, the global picture about disaster. This is kind of the same thing in every place. And dealing with disaster, we have to take into account two frameworks for action, because we have a lot of science, a lot of uh, people working on that. The first one is the Hyogo framework for action, which was valid for 2005, 2015. And the main message was creating early warning systems that are people-centered. Okay, we will know more about that uh, uh, after war. And the second one, we see, which is still uh, valid, I know, is the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, uh, 2015, 2030. And the idea is, again, the, this is a key word, early warning system, uh, to increase the availability. So work, put some work into, in, into early warning system to develop them and make them available for people, you know? So we still, they are still people-centered. We will, uh, we will understand this better. And, but also you have to put them available. And this is one of the main duties of Semadent. For those who, who, who like uh, reference, this, uh, the Sendai framework was published in the International Journal of Disaster Risk Science. So um, what is an early warning system? So the idea of an early warning system is to generate and disseminate information. We are talking about information in here, okay? This must be done in a timely and understandable manner, okay? In order to prepare people, communities, individuals, organizations to act properly. So it's about to change the decision process. That's the idea. Oh? So we start, as we know here in, in meteorology, I'm a meteorologist, we know, we start with data, data without, but you ne we need to convert data to transform data into information because data per se does transfer any information for you, okay? So the information is the, is the data and do it with meaning, inter interpreted, understood, so there is some meaning, okay? Information can be transformed into knowledge Knowledge, when you find patterns, you find regularities, 
So it's a step forward. And finally, you can transform knowledge in wisdom when, in fact, you take the, 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 the best decision that you, you can take. Okay? So the, this is this kind of the, the process, the, ide the ideal process that the information uh, uh, can take into a, 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 an early warning system. And early warning systems, they have two pillars or two axes. So first one, you have to know about risk, risk knowledge, okay? So systematically, you need to collect data. Things, things that we are, we are used to do here in meteorology, we know very well how to do that, okay? So the key questions, are the hazard and the vulnerabilities well known? I think we, we are pretty fruitful in to know the hazards here in, in meteorology. What are the patterns and trends in these factors? Not only, not, not only the pattern to the hazard, but also in the vulnerabilities. Are risk maps and, and data widely available? So again, put it, into, put it into the word, I mean disseminate. The other axis, the other pillar is monitoring and warning service, okay? So are the right parameters being monitored? So when you monitor, you decide to monitor, you spend money, are you monitoring what is the key parameter? Is there a sound, a solid scientific basis for making forecast? Can accurate and timely warnings be generated? This is a challenge. Another important axis is, uh, is the dissemination and communication, okay? which is communicate risk information and early warnings. Do the warnings reach all of those at risk? Are the risk and the warnings understood? Is the warning information clear and usable? This is an important word. This is that usable. How can we measure that? The usability of the information. Response capability. Here is likely after. The, of course, we will not avoid the disaster. We are just uh, trying to, to be better prepared for that. So uh, build national and community responses capabilities. So it's not like, a, that's your duty, it's not my duty. It's all our duty, you know? It's all our responsibility. Our response plans up to date and tested. Our local capacities and knowledge made of use of. Are people prepared and ready to react to warning? So those are the, the, the four pillars, four axes that we, that, that in Semaden, we, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, we, we try to follow this in every uh, task that we perform that. Not always we, 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 are, we succeed, but anyway. And here I brought this concept, which is a concept that comes from sociologists, from anthropologists, from people uh, from the education side of the science, which is uh, a comparison. I mean, the, the advocate is for the first mile approach. And because they notice that the, the most comprehensive the most uh, frequent approach is the last mile approach. So what is the difference into building early warning system? The last mile approach is top down, while the first mile approach is bottom up. So you go to the communities, you go to the society. Here you define needs from the top. Here you identify. You will only identify if you go to the, to the community. The last mile approach, so al alerts or warnings are delivered which is pretty much what we do, what we do there at Semadan. Uh, development of the early warning system is people-centered, which is kind of uh, another key, key word. Um, uh, activated uh, by the hazard. So there is a hazard, then you, you, you take the decisions. You, you try to change the things. So here is mostly hazard and vulnerabilities, because the vulnerabilities are always there. So you have time to think about that. But the hazards, they are episodic. You are waiting, it's kind of the same thing. You're waiting for the disaster. Here you truly work into disaster risk reduction, which is kind of a, a, a perini is a, a, a task, you know. Mainly technical components. Here you, you, you have to add, you have to sum up uh, technical plus social components. Knowledge is kind of alien to, to communities. It's normally it's kind of in the university, in the technical institutes. And that in the first my approach, you also bring what is known, uh, which is known as traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge is that imagine that old man in the community that kind of knows, 
that old fisherman knows that if the the cloud covers an island in front of your 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 beach, the, the weather is coming to 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 become harsh. This is traditional knowledge because the, this old man lives in that place for a long time, so he accumulates intuitively this kind of of knowledge. So they preserve, they try to preserve this kind of knowledge. So we have an equation. We have an equation in social science. The equation is risk is equal to hazards times. In fact, there is uh, one, uh, uh, one variable here that is missing, which is exposure. But here we are assuming exposure means that you can be exposure to, to the hazard or you cannot be. An example, uh, uh, a typhoon or a, um, a hurricane. If it is in the middle of the ocean, there is no exposure unless you, are, you care about the fish or something like this. But here we are, we, are kind of, we are imagining that we are always, we are exposed to the hazard. So hazard times what is called a vulnerability. And you can diminish. So in this equation, you are, you are already working with factors that can diminish, can mitigate the effects of the hazard. Okay, so the risk is, is kind of a multiplication of probabilities. So you have the probability of the hazard, which is pretty much we, our, our task, our task. I mean, now I, I'm, I'm putting my dress of meteorologist, you know. So what is the probability of hazards? But also the chance of a negative impact. Okay, it's another probability. The hazard can be not only natural. This is another thing. They, they, they social scientists, they think more comprehensively, you know. They, they talk a process, phenomenon, or human activity that may cause loss of life. Okay, we, we can remember Brumadinho. Brumadinho was a, 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 a disaster and was caused by the man, you know. Um, vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities is, is, is important. The characteristic determined by the physical, social, economic, and environmental factor or process which increase the susceptibility of an individual, a community, assets, so buildings or systems to impact of hazards. And you, here are the two terms that can help us to diminish the, the, the impact, you know, to diminish the risk, in fact, which are the capacities, to build capacity into society, physical, social, and economical means. Knowledge is also a capacity. Knowledge and ability to anticipate and to cope, since you, if you cannot anticipate, you can cope with and recover from the impact. And mitigation basically are policies. In this case, we, we count on the government policy uh, to create preparedness. OK, so this is kind of, before I enter into the, the second part, this is kind of I brought some of the, those of, of things are mostly new for me also. I'm a meteorologist. I, I was raised, I was grown into the, the science like you. Uh, but I, I, I kind of bought this the idea, you know, because I think that this is uh, this is important, really, to to try to think different in a different point of view. So let's see a little bit about uh, Semaden. I will shortly introduce Semaden. is the Center for Monitoring and Early Warning uh, for Natural Disasters here in Brazil. It is a unit of the federal government, and it was created after what is. Uh, arguably uh, call it as the greatest weather related disaster. Okay, so in January 12, 2011, 12, 13, and 14, we have the greatest climate disaster in the, in the mountain chains in Rio de Janeiro, two cities, Teresopolis, uh, and we had over 900 fatalities. As you can see, it rained a lot. I'm not quite sure, but probably over 300 millimeters. If some if uh, someone knows the, the exactly uh, value. I mean, the, in fact, was a lot of rain. But the other fact, as you already know, occupations, I mean, irregular occupation of the, of the steep hills. You know. Non-official data claims for over more than 10,000 people affected because there was really a mess. And those 10,000 came from, the, from those instruments to, to measure electricity because they were found or every spread every in every place and there were more than 10,000 if you had 10,000 of those of those equipments probably you have 10,000 uh, residences in there 
So this is quite was a major really those things that happen in life and you cannot act like you were acting before, you know. So led to the establishment the establishment of the national plan for risk management and response to disaster. So before that, there was an there was not a national plan. I mean, so they, they noticed that some some uh, need to be to be done. So the idea of this national plan is based also in four axes, but those are another four axes. Uh, so build a structure resilience. So that's why you have this caterpillar here. So uh, stabilization of the slopes, drainage, I mean dams flood for flood controls, this kind of thing, which we call a structure, structural actions. Okay? So buildings really. Uh, the response, since we, we cannot avoid really disaster, we can just mitigate them. This is a uh, responsibility of the Ministry of National Integration. Mapping, so you need to map the risky areas. You cannot work, we will see uh, right, right away uh, why you need these this risky areas. We need to, to map this, to know, basic, basically. And uh, Semaden, here in the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovations, and Communication, uh, the idea of strengthening uh, early warning networks, early warning practice and also early warning networks. So Semaden was created, okay, uh, very quickly. Uh, the idea is uh, to develop, test, and implement a system for predicting the maintenance. And this is the mission to pre for predicting the occurrence of natural disaster in vulnerable areas throughout Brazil, whole Brazil. Well, we have several duties, but I will just emphasize the produce early warnings is one of them. Uh, produce and release studies. So we are a research unit for the Ministry of Science and Technology. But we have operation, you will see. But we, you will not, you cannot grow your operation, make it better if you don't, you, if you, you don't do this research to feed into the, the operation. So, so to develop scientific technological innovation capacity, uh, for the continuing improvement, okay? Observation systems, you will see we will have to deploy uh, a, a, a huge network of, of sensors uh, to develop and implement computational models and to promote capacity building, training, and support. These are the, the main duties of SEMADEN. So SEMADEN works in collaboration, okay? We need, really, we need collaboration. We need data from other institutes, INMET, INPE, uh, the SEA, uh, uh, our geological survey, CP, which is called a CPRM, uh, our agency for national waters, uh, which provides hydrological information, the community, and also kind of more basic uh, research coming from the university and research institutes. The idea is to provide SENAD Senade is the, the federal control for the, all the civil defenses so, uh, in, in Brazil. So you have the Senade at the federal level, you have the state civil defenses, and you have the municipalities, which have also the local defense. They will effectively go into the place after a disaster or do the, the, the work locally, which is kind of very needed. So this is the civil defense at the, at the local or municipality level, which is responsible for establish create the contingency and response plans. So this is a, a, a network besides the, the previous network from the, from, from the climatological uh, uh, point of view coming from INMET or INPE, we had to deploy uh, a new network of sensors. We, we had to deploy rain gauges, automatic weather stations. Uh, I think they are here, so the yellow points, which is kind of the 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 bulk of our our, our network, are the, the automatic rain gauges, rain gauges. Also, another we automatic weather stations uh, to measure uh, soil moisture, to measure river levels, which are the the blue ones here, PCD hydrologica, and also two other radars, nine radars, covering regions that weren't covered before by raiders. We do not, we do not issue, uh, issue or alerts or warnings for every county, every municipality in Brazil. 
simply because it's, it's kind of impossible now, at least presently. But so we had to select some, mon some municipalities, some counties. What, is, uh, what are the criteria to select? So the municipality must have the risk mapping. So before you had to do, you can, uh, who did that? What is the, our geological survey uh, regarding uh, a geological survey together with the hydrological service, which is uh, our national agency for flood risking. The, the also the, the municipality had already registered, must be a registered disaster in the county, counting in that, the, those first two graphics that, that I, I show it to you, okay? And currently we have almost 1,000 municipalities being monitored, which are those ones, okay? So we have a non-stop operation room, so 10, uh, seven by 24. Here's a picture of the, of the, of this room. Began in December 2011 and counts on four, each team is, is composed of four uh, professionals. It's a multidisciplinary team. You have, a, you have geologists, you have geo geologists or geographers, engineers, hydrologists, meteorologists, and IT professionals. But in the, in the case of the team, you have one hydrologist, one meteorologist, one specialist in, uh, one in, in geologist or geographer, and one specialist in natural disasters. This is the, the, the four forces that in place. The idea, uh, we, we issue early warnings for landslides, for mudslides, floods, floodings, flash floods, and severe draw, uh, and draw in, in general in the semi-arid region, but we recently we extended to the whole Brazil. Besides, I use it to, to, to emphasize this, to highlight this, besides that operation room, which was the regional one, the thinked one to, to work with like that, we have this weekly to seasonal operation, which I, I, I'm part of, which is an operation that is outside that room. It operates in a kind of a slower pace, weekly or monthly. And we, we have meetings, we have weekly meetings with the, uh, mini, with the Ministry of Mining and Energy, with the Water National Agency, also with representatives of the states and municipality and, and private sectors, energy sectors, I mean, this is published. In, in the idea, the purpose is supporting the decision-making process, you know, with whatever uh, tool that we have at, at our hands, okay? Um, and some of the main hydropower for, for hydropower generation or, or water supply, okay? I can exemplify some, San Francisco, for instance, those are, are watersheds here in Brazil. Madeira, they're in, in the Amazon, Parnaíba, and Tocantins, which are in the southeastern most to the central, central uh, part of Brazil. We have also to issue monthly reports about drought over Brazil. I will show some example of these developments. Monitoring by means of integrating drought index, so we created uh, this index, and impacts on vegetation. Monitoring, monitoring projections for the Tres Marias, uh, Serra da Mesa, and Cantareira reservoirs. And we also have monthly meetings. Recently, we established these monthly meetings uh, for assessment and, uh, and scenarios. So here, uh, we are trying to give some uh, foreseen into the future. So we work currently. We work with scenarios of potential impact impacts for strategic sectors. Okay, I highlighted the term weeks here because I personally involved into subseasonal research. So I I have this research interest, and I would like to see in the near future we will uh, using this uh, predictions for the next weeks into this kind of uh, developments here. So how is this thing of issuing an alert or a warning? So those are the disasters. You have one state uh, which is kind of uh, ever present, which is monitoring and observation, which is the, the, the green one. Then if you see conditions, you, you have to combine two things here. You have to combine the likelihood, the probability for occurrence with the potential impact. Remember, I, I have already mentioned that before. And then you can com combine, this is not easy. I mean, the, the, the matrix was established, as, this is the procedure established by the Interministerial Decree in 2012, so it's the, it's the way that it must be, be done. But it depends 
uh, on very analytical and intuitive, I mean, uh, uh, thoughts to, to decide where if I have a moderate potential impact, but a very high likelihood of occurrence, I will issue an alert at, for moderate, uh, at moderate level, okay? And you can see you, you, are, you are combining this and you have the very high uh, level of, of alert for very high probability of occurrence and very high potential impact, okay? You can only know about the potential impact if you know the risk areas. Why? This is because the, the mapping of the risk area is so important. Sorry. So this is one, tr one real uh, warning alert. So you have this information, the, the number of, uh, of the alert in, in, the, in that year, time precisely, which was uh, open, municipality. It was normally is open at moderate level. I will, have, I will show you also the timeline. The risk scenario. So you have areas prone to landslides, which is exposure. You have dense occupation, vulnerability. So those are the four, those four people at the operation rooms that they, they have to evaluate to assess this, to appraise this. Look at the, at the, at the rainfall rates. We have the, all those rain gauges, automatic rain gauges, because they measure every 10 minutes. So you can estimate your rainfall rates are very high frequency. So you had, you had in this case for the municipality of Rio de Janeiro, 35 millimeters over the last hour, which is a lot of rain, okay? And you had 30, 84 millimeters in the last 24 hours, which is also not a, a uh, you cannot uh, be blind of that, you know? We don't use numerical weather prediction, only observe the rainfall rate. And why is that? Because two factors they overestimate in January rainfall rates. So this, they are not reliable at, the, at this point, you know? And also because of the resolution, you will see, I will try to, to give this feeling of the resolution. Um, I took notice also about the, this, the diurnal, cycle, uh, diurnal cycle. This is another, another problem for us. So this is the timeline. Oh, as you see, this, this alert for this very municipality changes from moderate to high and to very high. Those are the, the times where this occurred. And it's all, it's all related to, to the rainfall that is occurring, okay? Those, those rainfall rates of 30, uh, 30 millimeters in the last hour. So you had this rainfall, you, you know that the, the area is vulnerable, you, you change the level of your disaster. You can see that this, this, from the moderated to high, it's in the, in the turn of the night, you know, from the one day to the other, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the night, you know? So this is kind of a, a huge decision. And then for very high, because it started to rain again, okay? So you know that already the, the, the soil was saturated with, with moisture. And there was indeed a landslide, I will show you this, unfortunately, with two fatalities. Two people died in this picture. You are not seeing that, but this happened. This is what the kind of, uh, of, of domain that we are using to see. Uh, I see a lot of pictures with the, yesterday with this, this domain, this picture. So you can see a very known situation here, a cold front in the ocean with a reflex here uh, in the, in the, in in the, in the shore, I could say, not in the continent, okay? Um, as you can see, this is 12, and this is uh, uh, in the middle of the night. So the diurnal, diurnal cycle, is, this is, I, I, if I follow also, so I have this feeling that the diurnal cycle is very important because normally during the night, after the sunset, the system gets stronger. This is almost, 100 percent of the thing. So this is the place we are looking. Look at look at, at the, the zooming into. The, we are talking about this where the hand is. Now we are, we are zooming in. We are talking about this. This is just to show that that, that you cannot issue an alert based on a, on a satellite imagery. This is the municipality. This is Rio de Janeiro. Okay. Here, radar imagery is absolutely priceless tool for rainfall rate estimate. It's, it's like we had rain gauges everywhere, you know? So radars are pretty much important. 
because you need to know this, this rate for rates. So we are talking about the municipality of Rio de Janeiro, which is like this. Those are the, the risk the risky areas, the most risky, the risk mapped areas. Just a zoom. We're talking about over the municipality of Rio de Janeiro, more than 100 risky areas. Okay? And you know, you have to, to know, you, you are talking about the municipality, but you also, supposedly, you need to know where is the exact point where the landslide is going to occur. And this is the exact point. Okay, so there is a, a really a zooming factor that is kind of overwhelming. So this is just to, the message here is, well, the models indeed, they are kind of very steps back in order to solve, the, to, to, to be helpful to this kind of problem. Okay, but I mean, there is a there is solution because we, we, we assembled this, this, this uh, system. So what, what do you do? You rely on, wave, on radar and on the actual precipitation for rain, for, for rain gauges spread all over the city. Uh, okay, that's it. Just to give you a feeling of what is a, a, a truly uh, a, a alert issuing during the monsoon. And this is just one location. You can imagine in the room with four people, you have to look at those uh, almost 1,000 Municipalities, which we are monitoring. Of course, there the, is not raining everywhere at the same time, but uh, they have to deal sometimes with 20 or 30 uh, situations that you have to decide: we raise the, the, the alert level, or you you or you you go down, you go back, or you open a, your your alert. So it's kind of a stressing a stressing task, you know. So let's talk uh, about some uh, more relaxing things which are uh, development and researching. Um, we, we always, I think that one thing that kind of uh, is um, ever present, I mean, in our development is the idea to put some uh, information from the social and economic aspects, not only from the meteorological aspects. So this is one example, for example. This is the vegetation supply water index. This is a combination. First, the res and again, the resolution. This is one kilometer resolution, OK? Uh, we know that to run a model at the national level at one kilometer is kind of a, a huge task. This uh, index, uh, this accounts for the stress in the vegetation. This is one possibility for stress in the vegetation. So, okay, this is, so, so you, we created the, the anomalies since we have a, a short time series since 2002. So the, the, the regions, and then you divide into categories and you can see regions where the, the, the drought here in the Northeast and semi-arid region is most severe, like red ones or extreme where it's black. But there is a further step, a further development. You, ha you have to divide, you can, in fact, and this is kind of you're offering a, a more palatable, yeah, a more uh, uh, easy to digest product. This is to divide into, to account for the municipalities. And you have in each municipality the percentage of the, uh, of the impacted by drought in that case. Uh, if it's above uh, 50%, so is this is light brown. And if it's above 75%, it's dark brown. But why this number, 50%? This is not a, a ad hoc number. Because this was, think, which was thought uh, uh, to support the Garantia Safra, which is agricultural insurance program. And the term, one of the terms of the, the contract is that you must have to lose more than 50% of your, your crop. That's the idea. So there is kind of a, a mimetism. This is try to mimetize, to emulate the process. Of course, here in, in, in this municipality, you have several crops, several crop areas. But if you have this area affected by more than 50% in this area, likely also the crop is, will be affected by more than 50%. We use the standardized precipitation index. I'm, I'm kind of late. Uh, because we can, uh, this, was, this is what uh, it was created for. Uh, so with the SPI, with three months, we can estimate the, the impact into agricultural drought. 
and with six months, we can estimate impacts on, uh, on, andro on the andrological aspects of drought. This is one, uh, uh, one strand of the SPI. Uh, we, use, we created the integrated drought index, which is the composition of the SPI, and, v, and, and another index uh, by, from satellite uh, remote, which is the vegetation he health index. Likely also look, try to estimate the, the, the stress on the vegetation, and, of, and by, uh, by similarity, the stress on the agriculture, on crops. And this is the condition, I mean, for uh, recent condition for February, and you, you can see that by this, this index that the status of uh, Sergipe, Alagoas, Bahia, and Pernambuco, they are in, in a state of weak to moderate drought. And here we are trying to provide, this is that report that most limited when, when we try to provide a foreseen to the future. And I, I, I have to say that we, uh, I'm kind of keen to use subseasonal or seasonal, but at least for the next month's uh, prediction, try to experiment this, try to this, to provide this scenario. Currently, there are only scenarios. You just sum up, you just sum 20% above the average or subtract 20% above the average and recalculate the index, and you can have a scenario. And in this case, for instance, even, you, even having 20% above average for, for all Brazil, uh, you still have these regions they, they are here in, in, in situation of drought, weak to moderate drought. This is, those are the agrometeorological uh, stations who uh, they, they measure uh, soil moisture very quickly here. And again, we uh, develop uh, Marcelo Zeri, our agrometeorological scientist, he developed uh, an index and divided again into, this, uh, this is meso regions, like the metropolitan region in Sao Paulo, like the metropolitan region in Vale do Paraíba. So this has, is more meaningful for the user. So this is the state of the soil moisture, really measured. This, uh, those are very nice projects, uh, rain gauges in the communities. So the idea is to introduce the culture of risk perception, so we, you are working at the community level with people, so here, but you are working with, with rain gauges, as you can see. So you explain to them, what is a rain gauge? What is, what is a, 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 a elevated uh, rate for rate for you? Okay, it's this kind of thing. So trying to bring the knowledge from the top high levels into the, the community level. So they are, the, the expectation is that they are, uh, well, they, they become well prepared in case, in case of disasters. This is another uh, project which he recently was granted, uh, was selected uh, in, in amongst 100 projects over the world, only three in South America by the American Geophysical Union. And the idea is also, like in the, in the com uh, rain gauges in the, in the communities, to work into the schools, doing research, fundamental research, again, putting some fundamentals, uh, fundamental uh, topics of meteorology, Training, so there is a there, there is this ludic uh, uh, approach, which uses uh, education techniques, which uses edu education knowledge, uh, and of course policy articulation. So the the idea is to 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 create resilient and sustainable schools. Sorry, some something I, I imported this. We also do monitoring and uh, prediction at all again. Uh, by means of scenarios for some uh, uh, watersheds, important watersheds in, in Brazil, like uh, this one, uh, uh, Cantareira, Tres Maria. So do, you can see that this is in the core of the monsoon region. We are talking about the core of the monsoon region. This is very important uh, watersheds. So we monitor the, the reservoir levels, levels by means of putting an hydrological model in there and receiving and calculating. We, we have uh, the rainfall estimates. You, you can estimate the level of the reservoir and also uh, estimate into the future doing this, uh, this kind of thing of scenarios, you know? I think I will have to go for, I'm, I'm running out of time. This is crowdsourcing. This is another kind of very different thing. I think in meteorology, we, we don't use this too much. This is count on information from the, from the, the agriculture, you know, from the, the, the farmer, I mean. 
So the farmers, if they, they, they have access to this app and they can put the crop type, the pictures, the crop lands, planting date, type of harvest area, a cultivator harvest area. So you have information on what, how the drought is affecting this kind of in, in, in a real time. And again, the thing, the, the matter of the scale, we are talking about those, those two municipalities there in, in Minas Gerais, and those two municipalities, you have very localized places where you can see. So those are, are, are pilot sites where you can see the, the, the feedback from the, from the farmer. I think I'm going to, you suggest to go to the end? Okay, so ju just my, my conclusions, this. So I put some, some words, some sentences here just to think about. I don't have really conclusions. It's more like uh, showing what, what, what I think that is in this terms of disaster risk reduction, the, the pathway to follow. So the idea I, I have already mentioned to you, how to convert scientific knowledge about the American monsoon into wisdom. That's the idea. That's, remember those four, the, the, uh, you, which is useful information, which will change the decision uh, of the local people. Sorry. For disaster risk reduction, I think I, think I tried to convey to you that the spe uh, spatial scale, I mean, horizontal resolution in, in the case of our model matters. And also I think the diurnal cycle matters. I think if we don't have models solving really accurately these two things, it will be position of the rainfall, rainfall rates, amounts of rainfall, and uh, the diurnal cycle. When the rainfall becomes uh, more intense, becomes really uh, a hazard, you know, a potential hazard. The real war, the real war happened in polygons. So we're talking, we talk about watersheds, we talk about me metropolitan regions or meso regions, we talk about counties, we don't, because this is meaningful for the use. And of course, always we are always, this is kind of a, a, our mantra, at least for most of us, uh, attempt to walk on the user's shoes. So we are always trying to, well, 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 a user, we have a lot of contact with users, so we are kind of in, uh, exchanging information, trying to incorporate and promote the first mile approach, remember, which is kind of getting out of your comfort zone and looking to the, the other aspect, the, the aspect of the, the people that really uh, can be affected by the by the the hazard uh, that it can be a disaster uh, i think that's it gracias and uh, thank you Obrigado. Very nice work. Um, so uh, the first question is uh, in the example that you showed about the, uh, the flood warning. You mentioned that uh, uh, the, the weather forecast is not used, right? For other types of uh, um, dis uh, si um, disasters, uh, for example, windstorms or tornadoes, weather forecast can, you, can, can uh, give some timing to issue the warning. So is this, uh, is this done for, for other types of disasters? Uh, I mean, using the weather forecast. Yes, yes, sorry. Perhaps I, I, I didn't convey the message uh, adequately. That example is for mostly in the urban area for landslides, not for floods. For floods, we, use, we do use the weather forecast because okay. it depends, also depends on the, uh, basically on the size of the watershed. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if the watershed, as I said, is too small and too steep, that the time between the, the, the rainfall falls and go to the, the river is kind of 30 minutes, sometimes two hours, so then the water forecast is not very useful. But there are basins like that one that I show it to you, like the San Francisco or the Tres Marias, that you, we indeed we use. I didn't show products, but we, we do have products, at least for that. Uh, and we use ensembles. We use uh, up to 10 or 12 days. We use ensemble, the global forecast system. And so here is usable. But for, for uh, heavy rain, like tornadoes, 
in that in that arrangement that we have there, we we don't use currently. We, presently, we don't use. Okay. Okay. I don't know if it disappoints you, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. So the the other thing is, uh, I really like the slide that you had: data, information, etc., going to knowledge and wisdom. Now, the the end part is really tricky because people a lot of times a lot of times they don't know what action they need to take. So education is really important. And then you mentioned that you have some uh, project to uh, work with the schools and so on. So the other, uh, maybe this is a suggestion. So television can be really important. Uh, yeah. For example, in the US, the Weather Channel, they have some very nice uh, uh, programs to educate people what, what they should do or not do during a type of disaster like tornadoes or or flash floods, you know, driving under even a very sh uh, shallow water, but fast water can carry the cars away and so on. So that wow. I think this is really important. The education is really important. Yeah, thank you very much for the suggestion. I think it's valuable. Also, I agree with you. Uh, in in the monitoring, uh, for example, for this case that you showed in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the bus that was <laughs> uh, with the landslide. Um, I think the, the front was on day four of February. So you only started doing the alert, the first part of alert, when the rain was above 35 millimeters. Uh, mm. like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you... Said. And... Uh, so uh, the the forecasting maybe you you knew that the the front was coming. Uh, isn't there one zero alert, for example, for the possibility of that front uh, cause some problems or heavy rain? Because if you only do the alert when the the rain is is already there, maybe. The, the, that bus did get this uh, alert. Why is the... Yeah, well, yeah, very, nice, very, very good point. Uh, what I can say to you, Iracema, is, is this. I I'm, don't, don't work. I, I talk to people in the operation, but I don't work there. Likely, uh, a person from the operation would answer you better. But what I think is that all the alerts are uh, triggered at the moderate level, OK? The moderate level means something for the Senate, for the civil defenses. So they start to, to doing something, you know, at the moderate level, hypothetically. But when it's raining, oh. it's Yeah, yeah, when it's raining, it's our case. Okay, that's it. Yeah, but it's raining, but I mean, you don't know if it, it's not because it is raining that it becomes into this, a disaster. Sometimes rains and there is nothing, okay? So there is supposedly, again, because it's tricky, this thing. There is time to, to do something. Uh, the problem is that if you use the model and you start to trick that actions and you have a high uh, levels of false alarms, I think this is the main problem. Because you start to move it. Some, some local civil defense may start to really, oh, hey, you, you, you are at home. Come here because we need to, you here because there is a, an alert at moderate level. And then nothing, nothing happens. I don't, I'm not saying that we don't have false alarms. We do have false alarms. But I mean, I think that the problem is because it really, uh, we, we, and also because of the, the, the spatial resolution, because the model will put likely a, a grid point at one kilometer, they will put a grid point over several risky areas. So what, you will have to combine this information with the, with the grain gauge, with the rain gauge that is happening right at the same moment. So I don't see we have too much. I, unless we really do, we, we have a little experience into models. Be, uh, I mean, with grid points, one kilometer and even uh, finer grid. So this is what we need to, to, to know better these models, not models at one high, uh, kind of 20 kilometers of, I think so. For this specific problem of LED lights, this is very nervous, like I said. And then uh, in Tamoyos, the roads, for example, that goes from San Jose to uh, the, the, near the sea, uh, Caraguatatuba, close to the sea, there is a, a steep uh, road. And then uh, when 
they think that food uh, have some less life because uh, there was there is one frost or uh, starts raining. They close the road, so they it, it's not a false alarm or sometimes it doesn't have a happy ending, <laughs> but uh, at least they uh, try to avoid some uh, disaster. Okay. Uh, I don't know if they get this information from you, from Timadei, or no. <laughs> In the case of Tamoyos, I, I don't... I, there are many small geometers in Tamoyos. There is the... The empresa que cuida da Tamoyos. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they do this. Uh, yeah. Likely, they, they do a... a, a Yes, I think you, you are completely right. I mean, the, the key point is the actions that the alert triggers. What those actions, because the, those actions cost money. If you close the roads, if you close the road, you are losing money. So sometimes, so you, you need to be accurate. I think we are, what we are missing, okay, what we, so just one point, what we are missing here is more research into these high resolution models and how they can be benef how can benefit this kind of, of, of thing. Okay. Sorry. Uh, very interesting your talk. Uh, since your talk was on hazards, I was expecting to see something about uh, fire fires risk uh, reduction. But uh, she told me that there is a center for fires prevention. Um, Sorry, I lost. Uh, she she told me that there is in Brazil a center for fires prevention. Uh, for fire. So my question is, what, what is the relationship between uh, SEMADEN or, or if SEMADEN does any um, risk analysis for fires or there is a connection with this center? Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't bring all the research but or just, development. Just in because yes, it's yes. An we, uh, the answer, the short answer now, to, your, so to, your, to, know. to your question is yes. There is, we have a specialist, an expert, which, which is, uh, she's Liana Anderson, and I kind of uh, work it, uh, with her a couple of times, and mainly we are focusing into the southwestern part of Amazon, <coughs> specifically in the Acre state, because there we develop a kind of a very tight relationship with local authorities. There is their institute called it, uh, Institute of uh, Climate Change, and they are very well organized every year because they have this is seasonal. They have this fire station. They have this. They have the dry station, which is the, their summer. They call it summer, the summer because it's dry, and 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 it's the time of the year when here is not raining. They are also a monsoon type of, of region, which is comes from May May June to September. So what is happening right now, all this polemic in, in, in the television, is because this is no that people start to, to put fire, you know, to prepare the land because the, the, the rainy season is coming. And there in the Acre, they know that, so they, they, they have these meetings monthly or weekly, it depends on the, on the, on this, on the huge amount of, of on the amount of uh, fire, fire, and they prepare with uh, fire fighters, they, are, they, they bring the mayors, they bring the, the scientists, so they have this multidisciplinary team at the administrative level. So this is very nice. So we do that, but we don't do like the INPE, which monitors remotely. We use the INPE products, but the idea is just to exactly to do that, to build this consciousness, to build this better decision process. I just don't uh, did, did not bring this uh, this research here for you. So, so you in Hotspot uh, monitoring from satellite? No. There are some indices to detect uh, possible uh, hotspots for, uh, for fire, so you don't have that. No, uh, INPE does that. SEMADEN does not that. It's not the same institution. It's not the same institution, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. We use, in fact, this is a valuable and a priceless work done by INPE. We use that to build, so we, we, we try to go a step further to go into the, uh, to, to build this, uh, this uh, early warning system, like I said, you know, together with the community. That's it. Oh, 
thank you for your talk. Um, just out of curiosity, I was just wondering, um, when dealing with disasters like Mariana and Brumadinho, which were uh, caused by mainly the uh, lack of responsibility of one single private uh, company, uh, how does it fit with Semaden in, in Semaden? I mean, does it is it monitored by Semaden or where does it enter in, in the the graphic that you showed before? It doesn't fit. It, we we are. I avoided the word natural disaster because, as, as I said, I bought the idea that there is no natural disaster. There is a hazard, a natural hazard, because the disaster has intrinsically the human component. But we don't we don't deal with technological disasters because this is a no, completely another issue. You will have to monitor externally a company, as you said, an enterprise. And you need a very uh, solid knowledge of geology. I mean, this is completely here. We are built for for this. We call climate weather related uh, disasters. Okay. Another one. Expert. Nice presentation. Well, uh, if you have uh, many uh, places at at risk, at risk, and you have a limited number of people in your team, how do you decide which place you will monitor or? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> that's, that's up to the team in the operation room. I, I don't know how they decide. Um, I mean, I think it is kind of ad hoc. I mean, uh, sometimes it depends. If, it, if it's uh, a very rainy, this is another aspect. If, if it's a, a rainy season, a rainy monsoon season, we will have more work. And likely more failures also. Mm -hmm. If the rainy season, if we have to, we have some chance to estimate that, is more dry, so you you are in a more comfortable position, because likely you will not having something happening at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. this is I can I can tell to you. But I, I mean, the, I I know. I mean, from people that this is kind of very very nervous place to be. You know, there. Just. Uh, answer just if you have a quick answer for this. Uh, you showed a map of the municipalities that are monitored or uh, to which uh, Semaden issue uh, alerts. Uh, uh, what's the criterion to be in this list? Having a disaster previously ah, recorded, okay, okay mm -hmm. and having risk mapping. Okay, thank you. So. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> now, Cecilia Hidalgo from the University of Buenos Aires will talk about collaborative processes in action, climate services, and impact-based forecasts for Southern South, South America. I have it already oh, in okay. the, ah, yes. Yes? Sí, lo, ten, lo puse acá. Ah. Well, oh. ah, ya so tienes, ah. Well, yeah. yes. Again, thank you very much for the invitation. I have uh, had a beautiful monsoon week here with you. I hope you could uh, invite me again. I'm a kind of uh, visitor. I, as I said, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm working with climate community since more than a, de a decade. So I, would, uh, I wanted to show you some collaborative processes in action, uh, some experiences I shared with, uh, excuse me, uh, many, many uh, professionals and stakeholders around the provision of climate services in South and South America. Uh, the collaboration processes, <coughs> many people call them 
collaborative turn uh, are related with the previous speaker. Uh, you see the social context poses pressing scientific and democratic challenges around strategic objectives that include, in a central place, climate issues. So you have many new concepts, the idea of a climate service, the idea of uh, impact-based forecast, the idea of co-production of knowledge and services that is in the environment now. What do we want? An assurance of the quality of knowledge and also of the legitimacy of decision-making procedures uh, and that issue becomes crucial. You need very, very good knowledge, and, but also a democratic uh, way of solving climate problems also. So there is, in this uh, collaborative turn, cooperative turn, people coming from academia, for government organization, non-government organization, social agents, stakeholders interacting to co-produce relevant and robust knowledge able to support collective action. There are many, many problems that are cognitive, but also pragmatic involved in these processes. Many difficulties that are multiple, but they must be overcome. What is there in, an, in the name of climate services? Maybe you, you know it already. There is a definition I took from the National Research Council. It is the idea that you need to have a timely production and delivery of useful climate data, information, and knowledge to decision makers. We spoke about that. And there is a large and widening road going to this new paradigm. They, many people call it a new paradigm, that of the climate services. Uh, there is a report of the US National Academy of Scientists, uh, Sciences that highlighted the importance of climate becoming an increasingly important <coughs> element in the public and private decision-making processes. And there you, you have the first definition of a climate service. And then you have in uh, to, uh, 2009, the uh, is, is establishment of the global framework for, for climate services at the World Climate Conference uh, that made this vision be shared, in a sense, it's a kind of uh, uh, moment of consensus around the idea. The idea was growing far, uh, uh, from previous uh, initiatives, but it had a, a real statement at that time. There are five components of the global framework for climate services. Maybe this uh, scheme is very well known. And uh, the, the new component is what you see up there, the uh, user interface platform. Of course, when you need to production of knowledge, you need observation, climate knowledge, observations, monitoring. Of course, you need research, prediction, monitoring. <laughs> you need capacity development, we are here developing capacities. And uh, there is something new that is to uh, organize a system that could deliver the inf uh, informa climate information. But this idea that you have to uh, enter in contact and, and cooperate and have a dialogue with people outside the scientific community is indeed new. There are so many targets now if you want to provide climate uh, services. You, don't not, uh, you do not just to produ uh, product knowledge. You, you have to provide an interpretation, an assessment, 
a kind of synthesis of diagnostic and forecast information in, on multiple time scales. And you have also to tailor that information, taking into account that your audience is varied, that they have different interests, different knowledge. You have to be able to communicate, to disseminate that information. <laughs> There is also an idea that you have to be able to translate information into action. Uh, as uh, maybe you, you have read, that something is useful is not the same that is to say that something is usable or could enter into action. So there, there must be some kind of translation of that knowledge into a pragmatic a uh, fear of considerations. And there you see the idea of co-production because this cannot be done just on a spasmodic uh, way of acting. You need some channels of dialogue, exploration of institutional structures able to support this new type of co-production, co-exploration of usable, act, uh, actionable knowledge. There are two senses involved in the idea of co-production. And you will see collaboration, co, co, many, many, many words uh, uh, starting with co now. So, but let's talk of co-production. Uh, the concept of co-production that, that has been included into main documents of the uh, double, of the World Meteorological Organization it has two main trends of meaning. The first one is the idea that you have to articulate uh, perspectives and values of different sciences. And here we come. Social sciences are needed also. Not just meteorologists, hydrologists, physicists. physicists. You need people that could go to terrain, to, to talk to people, also to be able to make smooth the uh, interdisciplinary communication and, um, and well, communication. And then you have also a society that has changed. So society is also co-producing some new uh, ideas, uh, transform identities, I many times, uh, here say, what, what are they there? Maybe they are uh, people coming from engineering, from, I don't know, uh, oceanographies. The, the formations are very different. So uh, in a sense, they, they say many times, well, I am, I don't know who I am now. I studied physics, but now I don't know. So there is a kind of transformation of identities also. Institutions change. You, you have to talk to people that are not the same as you are. Uh, languages, discourses, and that's a new working of science and technology within society. Well, this emerging approach has uh, some specialities, new aims, as I said, to produce usable, actionable knowledge to support adaptation decisions, to provide straightforward estimates of uncertainty, and to meet the needs of climate-sensitive sectors. The first sectors were agriculture, energy, uh, well, uh, health also. And this implies collaboration among researchers, but not just interdisciplinarity. That's difficult. But more difficulties, also with stakeholders, stakeholders, outreach specialists, and uh, user-centric research programs. There are landmarks, previous international initiatives. There are many, many processes that start in the 70s. Uh, you see here, I, I won't read them, but there is a conference of human environment uh, in, I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 
in that previous to also uh, uh, Rio conferences in 92 and the conformation of different uh, international programs, the World Climate Research Program, the International Geosphere Bio Biosphere Program. You many times know them as much that they name by the, the, the just the, how you say this, las siglas? Well, you say a UNEP. But uh, what is very important in these previous initiatives is also in 1988, the uh, establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change that has m made a lot of uh, um, work to put climate change and climate in the center of political discussions and that this, uh, the panel does, does not carry on research but has produced and published eight, six, eight detailed assessments of scientific literature that's very important for the scientists, uh, for sci climate scientists. And the connection with policymakers is of utmost importance. You see that all the IPCC process uh, goes directly involved into the conference of the parties. Uh, and that, that is very important as, uh, for, for what we are dealing now, the idea that these issues are uh, central to impacts, vulnerability, mitigation, and adaptation that's the center of the program, of political problems now. Well, there is a very uh, light uh, kind, <laughs> I, I like this timeline for natural and social scientists' uh, interaction that comes also from the, the 70s. You see there are many, many initiatives that say that this work cannot be done alone by natural or mathematics uh, scientists, but that the social scientists must be there. <coughs> and there is a hallmark here that is the moment in also 2009 when the Belmost Forum established that international funding agencies should uh, collaborate all together to uh, provide good funding for this kind of research. Now we have, uh, as a, a very important program, Future Earth program that was launched in Rio Plus 20. There is a long path in this kind of collaboration because many times social scientists were asked just to uh, inform about changes in land use or soil coverage, vulnerability, mitigation, adaptation. But we're also now committed to these uh, values that are important for all the climate community, that is to uh, improve scientific credibility. So you have to really produce very, very good work if you want to be usable. And also, there are new values, the idea that the scientific community should show independence from corporations, from governments that should have a kind of impartiality that is new, that has to be committed to inclusion. The, you, you cannot, the, the term, Vulnerable people does not drop from any document. So the idea of inclusion is very important and also the idea of equity. Uh, well, I, I will see my time. Uh, I wanted to show some uh, experiences in collaboration. I have participated, I had the, the honor and uh, the pleasure of participating in some uh, very um, uh, important, let's say, projects that had that uh, idea of the provision of climate service 
uh, in South America. Uh, you could read some uh, here, uh, but I will comment only on two of them. The one that was um, funded by the III, that at the same time is funded by the National Science Foundation, and also uh, another one that, because one is uh, centered on the idea of climate services and the provision of climate services <laughs> in South and South America, and the other one has to uh, do with an exploration on how to collaborate with the production of uh, impact-based forecasts. Let's see the first one. Well, we constituted uh, not a project. The, the new idea as, uh, of the organization of this kind of project is not that the, of, uh, of a typical project, but the metaphor is that of the network. You form collaborative research networks. We were a collaborative research network that had people coming from Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, and also the United States. And they belong to three kinds of uh, types of participants, academia, governmental institutions that had to do in this case with not just meteorology, but also agronomy and um, Yes, uh, and different uh, governmental uh, institutions committed with uh, agronomical issues. And also stakeholders, not direct stakeholders, but associations of uh, stakeholders. In Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, the same structure. From the States, we had only academics. We had a regional focus, that's very important. It was uh, um, a, a network that uh, had to work, as I said, in southern Brazil, eastern Paraguay, and central eastern Argentina. And what was a hallmark of this network was a strong interaction with the establishment of the regional, I, I always, I'm sorry. The strong commitment with the establishment of the regional climate for South and South America, the RCCC established for the uh, regional, third regional by the WMO. Caio here is a witness and principal actor of this establishment. What was the plausible institutional structure of this regional climate center? Regional climate centers are new institutions. They, they are regional. In this case, you don't have a, a building. It's just a virtual structure. That's what I said, that institutions might, must change. And it's... Um, formed by six countries, Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, Uruguay, Bolivia, and Chile. Bolivia and Chile also participate in another regional center. But of course, you have to put in the center, in the in kind of core of these regional climate centers, all the national meteorological and hydrological uh, services and climate institutions of, of the country and of, of the different countries in the region. But you have also to have institutions that are governmental that had to do with water management, research institutions, and all the agricultural institutions, policy institutions that take part also of the, of the center. And as the user platform uh, prescribed, you have 
also to include stakeholders. <laughs> what happened before the creation of the Regional Climate Center? There were limitations for the provision of climate centers, but that linked, were linked to the uh, communication uh, between scientists and institutions. Yesterday, someone talked about it. Uh, many times, scientists have, I, I'm so bad with this, I'm sorry. Uh, scientists do their work, but in isolation with institutions, mainly operational and governmental. And maybe there are strong bilateral level uh, relationships, but they, they do not really always represent a broader network. The creation of the research center, uh, climate center, made that broader connection uh, uh, begin. When you don't have those broad networks, maybe uh, interdisciplinary collaboration is very limited to those things we, we do all the time. Modeling, modeling, analyzing variables, sharing observations, uh, creating some communication channels, trying to avoid duplications, uh, organizing panels, meetings, we are in a meeting now, uh, trying to co uh, common design and participate in research projects, maybe the, if this connection grows, we write a project and get funds, uh, sharing and exchange uh, trained personnel, elaborating several products, diagnostic reports, climate maps, etc. But this is not, I, I, would, I wanted to say just, it's not just, it's very important, you need it, but it's not enough to uh, fulfill the objectives of the provision of a climate uh, center. So after the creation, and the creation of the regional center had several steps. You had first to, to show you wanted to do it, and then there was a, an approval. The, the regional center got the approval. Uh, but after the creation of the regional centers, uh, everyone could see that the limitations started to be different. That they had to recognize the lack of knowledge about users now. Who were the users? Uh, what was their understanding and use of the climate process products? So you had to start exploration new channels for regular communication. I said the communications cannot be just spasmodic. It must be regular. Also, as when, when you talked, um, the meteorological and hydrological services do not have the uh, national authority to do some recommendations or to issue some products alone. They have to build really those networks to be uh, really legitimate, uh, a voice with legitimacy. So a main, a main target started to be a reflection uh, about how to identify, how to classify users how to discuss the roles assigned to them, not to repeat old uh, problems that uh, had to do with the idea that they are just informants. They tell you something, and then you do your products and business as usual. You, you follow your work at the academia. And there were some things that struck me as an anthropologist that uh, you started, Alice said something yesterday that uh, when you're at home, you, you speak about truth in the models. But when you speak with people, you have to speak about truth in the target systems. So, and there is a, a gap. 
there. So there are huge difficulties to uh, what of probabilistic and statistical inferences based on multiple models. And if you have there someone who would use it, you should convey uncertainty estimates uh, being uh, at, at knowledge of the audience at the moment, because perform, uh, there is a performative aspect of forecasts. If you give alerts all the time, people don't won't listen to you anymore. So. Uh, because they would do something, and if it's not needed or wrong, uh, the, the message must be unique, simple, clear, suitable to the recipient, timely, and must follow a familiar format. Maybe all those maps you are uh, acquainted with are not something that somewhat could catch and grasp the meaning of those maps. So. Uh, there are very, very uh, new things, many, many new things you, you should do. And at first times, experience and tacit knowledge made many times uh, prevail inferences that were conservatist or, or low controversies, to say more or less nothing. Could be so and the contrary, and let's see. So, when this regional climate center started, we had to start with the re-elaboration of climate products. The, you just needed to do new things, improve diagnosis, forecasts in different scales, create those spaces for dialogue and common work, construct platforms that could be uh, accessible and also uh, among institutions to, to, to improve interoperability. And uh, the aim of deploying early warning systems, think of, on impacts, made a quite difference. And that, uh, as I say, as I'm a um, social scientist, I'm always uh, very happy to see that collaboration among different types of scientists, social, natural, or also mathematics, engineers, is, uh, is in progress. Well, this is a collaborative turn, so we, we, we could say that there is a, a deliberative dynamics of, cooperations, of cooperation triggered by the creation of the original center, and that, that may uh, carried a reorientation of concerns and to, to take into account not only what scientists think as their responsibility, but also what public think scientists' responsibility. What we have done in this network, well, we combined res scientific research on climate with research to improve the way in which climate information and knowledge is analyzed, assessed, synthesized. As I said, this is a kind of summary. We honored a strong early commitment, involvement with a wide range of stakeholders who had worked closely with research at the university and mission-oriented agencies, helping to design the agenda and multiplying outreach venues. We worked also closely with the countries uh, participating in the research centers, and this made us uh, able to ensure that the products developed had a close fit to current regional needs, enhancing the likelihood of adoption and use. This is very important that um, operational institutions are committed with these uh, processes. And well, uh, we compiled a regional climate and sectoral dat uh, data sets. The, it is said that this database constitutes a major step for the region, being the first time that countries in CISA have collaborated to produce a consolidated set, 
set of climate data consistently controlled for quality. It's uh, the best science we can have in South America for data uh, compilation that is uh, expressed in this uh, database. Here you have an example of the number of weather stations and daily weather records included in the database. And, and you, can, you can see here the, the page of the uh, central uh, regional center that you have in Spanish and also in Portuguese. There's uh, two entrances and also the recognition of the uh, science that is included in the platform projects that were funded by, by these institutions. We worked on the implementation of regional drought monitoring and assessment systems. We calculated, it's not, I, I won't read it, but the ultimate goal is to implement a system for monitoring, planning, and responding to drought that's now in progress. I, I will talk about something later. We did research activities oriented to improving climate forecasts. We have an example here of things, works that include many people that are, are here now in the, in the room. We had uh, as a name the collaboration of early career scientists around many, many research <clears throat> Uh, projects that went into PhD degrees. We had many, many PhD degrees, master degrees, and also in Paraguay, uh, under degree, uh, under degrees, more than seven people uh, worked on on projects related to this uh, research needed to improve the monitoring and prediction. We had also uh, a sub network in, in, embedded in our network that was the uh, where all the uh, institutions and teams that worked on soil moisture indications they they shared all their knowledge wanted to uh, take acquaintance of what the other did not with the idea of, of doing a, a single model but because the pragmatic objectives are different, but uh, we could um, gather all these institutions and schools that were working on soil mixture. And we had um, early career scientists uh, there that go on with the work. Uh, we also had some uh, implementation uh, projects like ProRindes that uh, forecast yields in, of important crops in the region. And also we wanted to work with insurance groups, but that was the less uh, developed part of the project. And also we uh, monitored everything. We wanted to document the process, the working groups, the dialogue tables, the photos, and to, to, to see what happened when uh, communication of climate information reached uh, different audiences. So here you have kind of dialogue tables we had. This was a team. Maybe you recognize some people here. <laughs> some people are here. <laughs> so we're well known. And the other example, impact-based forecast, the pilot project. It was uh, only a year project that um, is in the south west uh, of the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, when we speak of not just now of climate services, but of impact-based uh, forecasts, uh, there is a new gap now. There is that there are forecasts and warnings 
of hydrological, hydrometeorological events, but there is not an understanding of their potential impacts. So there's a new uh, place for research there too, uh, but we had a, a lecture before, so you now know. And this is also uh, a name of the World Meteorological Organization to improve the understanding of the potential impacts of severe hydrometeorological events, uh, because that's a challenge for national meteorological and hydrological services and associated or agencies. We here had a, another kind of uh, network of institutions. Because here we have national organisms, ministries, we had uh, environmental uh, and agriculture. You have many uh, um, ministries. Uh, you have intergovernmental participants also, because through the national uh, meteorological services, you go to IRI, to NOAA, to OMM, to, to the regional climate center. But you see that uh, the components are, are different. Here you have bolsas de cereales, you have um, agricultural people, you have associations of farmers, and uh, you gather for different uh, aims. For instance, for uh, systems of alert, early warning systems uh, to, as you said, prevent fires. There you need uh, municipios, I don't know how you call them. Uh, uh, people from Cuartel de Bomberos, I'm a fireman, uh, Viality. So we participated uh, now uh, as a part of the service, national service of, of this network. And, and you see the network is very different now. So. Um, what's an impact, a drought impact? It is a region that it's uh, very dry, almost uh, near to this uh, desertification. So <clears throat> you should uh, recognize observable losses or change occurred in a, in a specific place and time because of drought. It's not just an impact in general, but you have to to have uh, const, uh, uh, as you say, registered and well established uh, changes or losses. Um, well, we have different losses it's in Spanish, so we identified economic, um, environmental, social, um, uh, impacts, impacts directly related with, with the scarcity of water, and that's very important to, to describe. And as you say, there is a kind of new uh, approach here uh, where you have to take into account not just weather and climate <coughs> extremes and your geophysical hazards, but also to uh, take uh, an idea of the different kinds of vulnerability specific uh, people have in different places, what's the exposure, and what uh, the identification of those social and economic impacts. You had already seen the kind of uh, matrix that is done with this kind of element. And what we, I can say just to finish is that um, this has been just the beginning. 
that we have many, many projects that follow these ideas, that are in line with these ideas um, as concerns drought. Now there, there has, has been a very important meeting in 2017, a workshop where all the uh, South America and also Mexico uh, tried to establish an agenda for future work, and that is now uh, in progress of concretions through the um, um, idea of having a South American drought information system. Now there is a project now starting that is funded by the Inter-American Development Bank and Euroclima. And if you see the main functions of the system includes all the elements we have already mentioned, investific research, monitoring, predictions, interdisciplinary research, compilation and synthesis of information in, to support planning, preparedness, mitigation, response, outreach to enhance awareness and knowledge about drought, and the implementation of a platform or, uh, or a kind of uh, data repository relevant for all uh, South America. There is a new climate value change where you have <laughs> a process that starts with all research, things we know, but also goes to communication processes that uh, focus on translation, tailoring, use, and different kind of outcomes. But for that, we need people. So here you, we are with different people committed with these objectives. Thank you very much. We have a, a, a project called Climax. I already told you something about this. But uh, it, it's a project that uh, has um, three main components. One is to understand the, the climate variability features, um, over uh, the impact over South America. <laughs> and the second is the predictability and prediction. And the third is the social component. So in this project, we are trying to uh, learn how to do the co-production. And uh, our um, uh, collaborative uh, focus is on uh, elect uh, electricity, energy, um, uh, ONS. I don't know if you, <laughs> yeah, we have one person from ONS here, and uh, uh, we are doing this kind of uh, co-production, but uh, we are still learning how to do this. And uh, there is uh, Hanzo, you know, yesterday we talked to him, <laughs> and he is in this project also. And uh, the, this uh, third component is related to uh, the understanding of this relation of climate scientists with the uh, users. We, we, we don't like to call them users because in this co-production, uh, they are uh, collaboration uh, people, not the users. Uh, because we understand that in the co-production, we need to uh, have a uh, both sides interaction. Uh, as you said, it's not uh, we are not uh, doing some um, 
products and giving to them. We need to work together to find uh, common uh, objectives. So uh, when we start this project, we thought that the social people would uh, do this uh, interface between the climate science and the uh, focus yeah. uh, uh, the applications. But they don't do this because they, they said, well, we are only analyzing the process of transformation from uh, the information from climate science to the uh, users. So what do you think about this interface? Because I think that this interface is very important. Because now we, science, uh, climate science, are doing this uh, interaction directed with the, the people from ONS. <laughs> What is your impression of about this interface? Should be uh, some special, uh, well, another group that could do this, or how is this done? <laughs> well, we use the name user because it's uh, in the documents, so we didn't want to. Um, I don't know, establish another word, it's uh, just for communication. We have also some uh, better ideas about the name, but uh, it's just to, to understand each other following these, these <laughs> trends established by the double, WMO, etc. That, that is in all the documents. I couldn't say what the s uh, social scientists should do in that project. This is, I, I don't know. I, I could say what we did in this one, and we just were one among others. Not, not someone who wanted to, uh, I don't know, do a special work. Of course, we have a specialities. All these people were interviewed by us. Uh, we we went to to see farmers and um, responsible uh, people responsible for mm, intendants. I don't know how you say people for for government. We did the uh, interviews, but we shared our our knowledge in all those regular spaces meetings, but. Uh, what maybe is the point of your question is that in this stage of the pro process, what you have first is a first uh, level of users that are called uh, secondary users. Maybe people that come from uh, governmental institutions, non-governmental institutions, associations of farmers, not just the, the last uh, farmer in the um, remote part of the territory. So this uh, kind of uh, communication is very good because uh, when you have, for instance, in the second project this uh, of the drought uh, impact-based forecast, uh, you have people that know very well their territory and nobody uh, are uh, specialists in agronomy, for instance, so they can make recommendations. You cannot do as a meteorologist. So what we had there were, were regular meetings, um, a meeting uh, three month uh, document where you had the meteorological part, agricultural part, also some things about um, fires and uh, roads and everything with recommendations. But th those uh, documents were um, elaborated in a collaborative way. But the main point of the meetings was, I think, that although the other people could understand what meteorologists and hydrologists said, 
and also meteorologists, what agronomists said, and what the, was the point for um, governmental people, and that was the point. Maybe uh, there is a, now an impossibility, and I don't know if that's desirable now, to reach the latest uh, user. Uh, that's not the stage now. Maybe we could do it uh, in another time, but I don't know if that's a real point for this kind of network. Victor. Uh, just, um, yeah, it's an interesting uh, topic. And uh, just, I have two quick questions. Uh, how to measure the impacts of these kind of efforts? I mean, I mean, we can here say we're going to do this and this and this, and we may can do a lot of uh, tools and platforms, but how to measure if they are really being used by the people or if there is any impact or change at their desk? Well, when you have the, the networks, it's uh, incredible. Well, first you have sources of impacts, research, all, all, also the media, media and those, all those um, documents where they report uh, impacts, but when you have this network, people know very well about the impacts. They know dates. They say, for instance, for um, crops. We had the uh, database of the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. But they say that's wrong, because they, me, they, they, they calculated that with the uh, satellite uh, data. And at the <coughs> field, it was not as bad. So they can correct all the data. But you can only do that uh, tailoring when you have people that know very well things and they know the as i said i'm astonished the dates the the number of uh, cows that died or what they had to discharge so you have many many gaps of information but you have a lot of information and if the research goes focuses on that information in some time, we could do some uh, systematization of that. But of course, the impact is uh, very locally uh, specific. So that's it. But it has to be objective. OK, thanks. And maybe just another question that it's kind of broad and overall. I mean, how to communicate these efforts to the really most vulnerable people I mean, we do all these kind of efforts and tools and all that, uh, and the intention is to somehow save, uh, to increase, I mean, to increase security, I mean, in the overall. Uh, however, people who is really more vulnerable to all weather and climate services, they don't really use uh, cell phones or, I mean, they just don't know, they just like, so how, how would you think that would be a better way to approach or to target that? Uh, well, the, the, there are many uh, explorations now. You have, for instance, these institutions uh, have a report, a three monthly report because it's climate information. They, they meet every, um, <coughs> Um, every month to um, do a report, but the report uh, is uh, written just once, uh, four, four times uh, a year. But they, they, all these institutions are committed, so they have at the level of the municipio, they have at the radio levels, the uh, agricultural associations have their own uh, farmers, and so that's a way of, of spreading the information, but it's not something you spread from top down, although it's very specialized. You also have a, a, plat a new platform here, but uh, the main use is for those 
intermediate users that are specialized people that are really happy to have all that good scientific information validated and uh, interoperational in their platforms. It's a new special platform. The user does not have access to that. Of course, he could have, but he, he, maybe he cannot make uh, a deep use of that. But you have all in the network a kind of uh, helping structure to get things uh, go further and also to uh, listen to people. For instance, those people that said, oh, you always give us bad news. Could you say something good about climate <laughs> once? And that say, well, maybe the, there is an, an over underlying, uh, and, and not underlying, under, yes, uh, stressing bad news. So many times people knew, uh, need other kind of reflection also about climate, but that's a thing you have with the feedback. And it's not something that meteorologists uh, can do alone. That's why I, what I say, you need collaboration. Uh, I, I, I many times see very good meteorologists uh, thinking that they could do this just alone. It's impossible. You couldn't do it alone. Uh, well, congratulations on your presentation. Very nice. Uh, I especially like the the line, the timing line that you you put it. I mean, I, I didn't. I wasn't aware that uh, this is a long time effort since the 70s. That was. Uh, very nice to see. And I think just a comment, I mean, it's not really a, a question. Uh, I think that as you you just said, uh, we meteorologists or people from natural science, uh, f f if you, you, you hear from people from social science or, or uh, in scientist education, education scientists, for them, the whole process is a result. So they, they, they don't need to get any numbers. The interviews are a result. You know? The process of approximation to the end user is a result. So they can publish, indeed, papers just relating, just, just telling about this, 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 uh, this interviewing, the, the, the increasing of knowledge. In the, they can do that. I mean, that is their science. I mean. So I think that. Um, this is something that is for uh, for us, me people from from hard side. I, I tell him hard science because it's number. We deal with numbers. It's kind of uh, strange, a strange thing to, but it, but it's there. I mean, so that's the reason why uh, uh, we need to work in collaboration. I think so, uh, in my opinion, to get this feeling, and we will have the results. So in the case of uh, Irasema's project. The, the very uh, process of communicating there, if you had a, a social science or, or someone in education, they, likely you will have a paper, probably, about this. That's it. Thank you. Well, it, it has been my idea that we must be just, we anthropologists must be just one among others. Because many times, uh, it, it may be a defense stance, but the natural scientists feel that uh, science, social scientists are very arrogant, that they are always critical, that they are always trying to, I don't know, <laughs> spoil the, <laughs> the project. And uh, that's not really the case, of course. Uh, there are many that are, <laughs> but it's a protective thing. I, am, I have been working with climate community for 13 years, and I had the proud of also have been uh, a PI of a great project. So it's not, uh, it's a process. We have to really work uh, recurrently together to, to get good networks. Okay, thank you very much. No, thank you. So I, I just, uh, want to remark about something I, I asked uh, yesterday. Uh, I said I, I would make a compilation of 
uh, work on climate change, on attribution of climate change in South America. Yeah, and I wanted people who know about uh, works in this uh, area and on these issues to send me lists of reference. But I forgot to say that this is focused on the monsoon, OK? So monsoon season, monsoon processes, OK? Climate change related to monsoon in South America. Thank you. So now we have the uh, coffee break. So uh, let's see. Please come back at uh, 11.25. Eu vou 